In the meantime, can you see my mouse when I'm moving it or? Uh, let me see. Mouse, yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah, okay, perfect. But it uh, is very small. Yeah, but I, I don't know how to change that. But, uh, 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 this one. Maybe you can use a pointer. I, I'm using a PDF, I'm not sure. <laughs> it does not uh, okay. Okay, yeah. it. okay, thank you. Thank you, Padmakar. And um, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, this is uh, our uh, 22nd uh, lecture in the IITM Cloud Physics lecture series. And uh, today we have a lecture by uh, Dr. Udran Sovan Deel. Um, actually, uh, he is going to talk about uh, the understanding the uh, particle number concentrations from satellite observations. It's a unique uh, topic. And uh, he's from uh, University of Sydney. Yeah, about the speaker uh, today, uh, Dr. Odran's uh, uh, research interests lie in the understanding of cloud physics, aerosol cloud interactions, and other radiative and their uh, radiative effects. And um, it, he uses a combined uh, uh, investigation by remote sensing, modeling, and in situ measurements. Um, so the, his expertise is in developing satellite re retrieval schemes. And he has long contributed to operating a shift from a traditional view on satellite products to quantities better adapted for model evaluation and uh, aerosol cloud interaction studies. His main uh, interest uh, lies in improving observation-based estimates for uh, effective radiative forcing due to aerosol cloud interaction for liquid and also ice clouds. Uh, though um, through better constraints on key cloud parameters such as droplet number concentrations, um, he works uh, uh, to give uh, actually a future outlook for uh, um, our uh, cloud physics research. So let us uh, um, um, uh, invite uh, Dr. Mahin Konwar to read out the abstract of the um, presentation today. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Uh, welcome, Dr. Odran. Great to see you here. Uh, the abstract as follows. Uh, the uh, cloud particle number concentration is central to understand cloud formation and growth mechanisms. Uh, it is therefore a key parameter for the representation of clouds in models as well as uh, for the quantification of cloud aerosol interactions. Despite this importance, this parameter remains poorly understood from satellite remote sensing. Our understanding of the cloud droplet concentrations has significantly improved over, over the last decades, but it still remains indirectly estimated from satellite observations under very restricting assumptions. For ice clouds, the ice crystal number concentration appears even more challenging and satellite estimates, uh, estimations have only emerged in the recent years. This lecture will review the challenges faced by satellite to estimate uh, droplet concentration and ice nuclear concentration, ice crystal concentrations, and offer a current state of the art of the existing methods and climatologies. So we welcome Dr. Odran to deliver his talk. Yeah, thank, thank you. you. Thank you much, um, Ahan and Tara, for the very nice introduction. Um, yes, so I'll ta start uh, then my talk on, uh, I slightly change the title so to investigating. So we'll look at uh, Cloud particle number concentration. So we will look here at a very particular um, parameter of clouds. We'll stick to this one because there is so much to say. So my, my talk will really focus on the, the particle number. So that's the amount of particle you have per unit volume. It can be for liquid clouds, like on the left here. Uh, you can uh, look at liquid clouds or ice clouds, so made of ice crystals on the right. And we'll look at this from satellite observation. So I had to narrow down to these two. Um, quantities, uh, number concentration, and satellites. So this will be the, the keywords for the rest. So as uh, was explained uh, by uh, Mahan just before, uh, the interest, so this, this is repeating a bit the abstract, but the interest is that um, getting a global distribution of the particle number, so this number of particles per, per volume, it is uh, quite important if you're interested in physics and in cloud physics, because it's so related to the nucleation process, to the formation of clouds, also to the growth and the, the life cycle. So if you want to understand this, 
uh, you usually need to uh, quantify and understand the uh, change in particle number. Uh, for the same reason, it's of course a key parameter in models, whether for climate or weather forecast or for um, different sort of models. Um, in, in the recent one, if you have a two moment scheme, you will predict the mass and the number. And so this is one of the two key components. And of course, if you're interested in aerosol cloud interactions and the, the climate um, effects, then uh, you need to have this quantity because the, the formation of clouds is driven by aerosols. And it's also the, so the first uh, quantity that you can look at and the most sensitive quantity to the aerosol concentration will be the, the cloud number concentration. So um, we have here two options. So uh, I will not talk about mixed phase clouds because it's even more complicated, but for liquid clouds, you have the cloud droplet number, so the amount of cloud droplets. This is a quantity that is uh, not really provided directly if you look at operational cloud products, if you download MODIS, for instance, or any other. Uh, you will not necessarily find the cloud droplet number, but you can calculate it, and I will explain you today how to do that. And um, if you're looking for ice crystal, it's even more challenging and um, more recent methods and different sort of methods. So before going into how to calculate it, uh, how to calculate the cloud droplet number um, from existing parameters, I wanted to give an overview of what we have currently uh, on satellite observation. And so we are all on the same page. Um, so the uh, one thing is that um, the first parameters and the first properties that we knew about clouds were mostly optical properties, because that's what we are sensitive to if you are looking at remote sensing. Uh, especially from satellite where you have uh, less constraints or more constraints, um, what you are sensitive to will be optical properties. So the, the first property that was uh, looked at and the, the most common one will be the cloud optical thickness. So the cloud optical thickness, COT or, or tau, um, it, it provides a direct measurement of the extinction of the cloud. So you look at the incoming radiation on the left, the, the uh, yellow arrow, and then you have, it crosses a cloud, it gets extinguished by here the droplets, and the, the amount of uh, extinction is related to something called the optical thickness. Um, so that was the first uh, quantity that was really looked at for, for clouds. Um, so where we are looking at satellites, and I'm here introducing all the keywords that I will use later. So it's a bit of uh, remote sensing 101 um, <clears throat> in, in case you didn't have that much satellite remote sensing. So if you are looking at visible wavelengths, one quantity you can look at is the reflectance. It's the, the amount of radiation that is sent back from the satellite. So it, that is um, scattered back or reflected to the satellite. And infrared um, measurements, you'll get radiance, watt per square meter per square radiance, or brightness temperature. And the brightness temperature is just the equivalent temperature of a black body that will emit the radiation that you're observing. So you have these two quantities, and I will use them again later in the talk. So that's why I introduced them here. Uh, so going back to the cloud optical thickness, um, there was an interest. It's not just convenient. Of course, from the cloud optical thickness, you can deduce the cloud albedo. There are these uh, simple relations. This is an approximation using something called a two-stream approximation. but uh, you, you can calculate this, and G is uh, some optical parameter that I will discuss later. Um, so you get a direct relation, or not direct, but quite a straightforward relation between the cloud optical thickness and the cloud albedo. So it means that if you have the optical thickness, you can calculate the albedo, and then you can make some radiative budgets and make some climate studies. So of course, uh, there was early on, this is a um, early, well, a paper in the mid 70s by Tumi uh, that showed that optical thickness and albedo are, are related, but this is, of course, this was discovered before. Uh, one of the message that I want to give here is that so the the reflectance or the albedo of the cloud is not only related to the to the optical thickness; it's also sensitive to the to the scattering properties of the cloud. How much does your cloud scatter, for instance, in which direction, what is the preferential direction of scattering? All these extra uh, properties that are called scattering properties or uh, optical properties of the cloud. Um, so depending on the scattering, so here on this figure, you have uh, several um, uh, several lines and each of the different curves here correspond to a different uh, sign here. This is this omega with a little zero, which is the single scattering albedo. This gives you the ratio of scattering compared to the total uh, extinction because you could also absorb in different ways than scattering. 
it, it's just to illustrate that if you change this, the scattering property of the cloud, your the relationship between the albedo and the tau that I showed just before here, uh, it changes. So the optical thickness is not sufficient enough to represent the cloud's albedo or the cloud reflectance, and you need another parameter. So this is the second parameter that is most um, retrieved from satellites. That will be the particle effective radius. And again, uh, introducing some terms. So the effective radius uh, is the how we quantify the size uh, of uh, the, the the particles in uh, for remote sensing mainly. So it is a radius that is area weighted. So the formula here as defined um, in early studies is, is this one. So you can see it's the ratio of the third moment to the second moment. So you have the units R3 over R2, and you have the unit of a radius, but it's divided by an area R2 times N, and N is the particle size distribution. Uh, you need another parameter if you want to reconstruct the full particle size distribution. You need a second parameter, which is the effective variance that gives you the width of the distribution. And so with these two parameters, uh, the effective radius and the effective variance, you can reconstruct the, any particle size distribution if you assume the shape. So that's what is below here. You start on the left from effective radius, effective variance. And then uh, from this, you can, if you assume a shape, which is usually a gamma function, a gamma distribution, you'll find back the particle size distribution, so the droplet size distribution of the ice crystal size distribution. And from there, you can get uh, these optical properties that I mentioned earlier. So with that, you can really constrain your reflectance. So if you're looking at optical properties, if you're looking at how to interpret uh, satellites uh, data in terms of reflectance, you, you can do it in terms of two parameters, which are the cloud optical depths and the cloud effective radius, and that's how we do it. So going back to this, so this is the same curve as I showed earlier, but instead of having the optical properties as different lines, now is the effective radius. So you see that for a small radius, the plane line, it's the top utmost line, so that will be uh, the, the highest reflectance, so the small droplets they scatter more, so they send more light back to space, and the, the larger one, they don't reflect very much, they absorb more. So um, basically, small droplets scatter more efficiently because they have a higher cross-section together if the amount is constant, um, and so they lead to a larger albedo. So this is this was observed very early on. Um, the, the typical example that you can look at are ship tracks. So in chip tracks, this is a, a measure from AVHRR uh, early uh, measurement 1990. This is a visible channel, and you can see that you have these tracks here, these lines of brighter clouds that correspond to ship tracks. So what's happening is that ship tracks emit CCN, and the CCN lead to an increase. Increasing CCN leads to an increase in the cloud droplet number concentration. Um, and if you have a constant amount of water, then it means that you'll get smaller drop because if you increase the amount and you keep the total amount of water, if you increase the concentration and keep the total amount of water, you'll get smaller, smaller drops. And the smaller drops we just saw are more reflective, so they show more, more white here, they, they are more bright. <laughs> so they enhance the cloud albedo, and this is what is called the Tumi effect. So uh, this, all these early papers demonstrated this link between uh, aerosols salts and, and cloud albedo. But I won't stay too much on aerosol cloud interaction and coming back to uh, satellite products. So the, the basic idea for satellite remote sensing, and I thought I will finish uh, at least all the way there. So how you make retrieval typically from MODIS, so this is the, the Nakajima and King method, uh, so-called uh, bispectral approach. Um, so you have a visible channel which is directly proportional to the optical depth and you have a near infrared channel that is proportional to the absorption that depends on the effective radius so this curve here is the same as the curve that i showed here almost it's the same idea um, so now if you have a couple of measurements a couple of visible and near infrared data you can take your observation like here so here you have a lot of observation and you put it in your theoretical table. And so you can say here, for instance, if I have an observation that is here, uh, the radius will be 12 micron and the optical depth will be 32. So and you can so you have a couple of channels and you can deduce the optical depth and the effective radius. Uh, so this is for liquid clouds, but you can do the same for ice clouds. 
Um, the one important thing is that when you are making such retrieval, so if you are using MODIS data or most um, radio metrics data, uh, the assumption is that uh, the properties, the radius, for instance, is vertically homogeneous and everything vertically homogeneous. So all the properties, optical and physical, are uh, homogeneous vertically. Okay. Uh, for ice cloud, there is a different method uh, that is called a split window, where you look at the brightness temperature as a function of a difference of brightness temperature. So the, the brightness temperature gives you the temperature of a black body, basically. So the warmest will be when the optical depth is zero, you are looking at the grounds, or if you remove the atmospheric absorption, uh, you're looking at the ground temperature. So it's very warm. And as the optical depth increase, you're looking at the cloud top temperature. And as you go from one to the other, the shape of the curve will depend on the effective radius of the ice crystal. Um, so the, the larger the radius, the big is the difference. And you can do the same as with this method. And then you, you take your measurement and you pinpoint inside your lookup table and you'll get retrieval. So this is how we get traditionally uh, optical properties from cloud. And by optical properties, I mean cloud optical depth and cloud effective radius. So this is how the world sort of looks like in a traditional uh, satellite remote sensing product. You get cloud optical depths for ice and for liquid. You get an effective radius here for ice and for liquid. Uh, these are early um, MODIS figures where you have uh, stratocumulus deck here breaking up. Um, you have the optical depth that is quite high here. Um, so the, the yellowish and orange is for liquid clouds and uh, the blue and green is for ice clouds and so you can see both of them together and find some estimation so if you are using um, geostationary data or if you are using any uh, spectrometer data you can always get these two products these are the, the basic products that have been developed for decades and they have been improved of course a lot so i won't go into further detail on that but this is the, the standard approach now if you want to go a bit further and if you're not just interested in optical parameters, but also in microphysical parameter, and we could discuss if the radius is indeed a microphysical or optical, but by construction here, I will put it in the optical uh, side. Um, so if you want parameter like the total water amount, or if you want the, the droplet, the number of droplets or the number of ice crystal, you need to take a step further. So I will start with the cloud droplet number concentration, which is the most uh, this thing that we, it has been developed earlier, so there is a bit more to say. Um, so it's not a typical parameter. If you download just the stationary data for in most products, you will not find the cloud droplet number. You could, but uh, typically not. So you have to calculate it yourself. And so methods have been, been developed to calculate the cloud droplet number from the cloud optical thickness and the effective radius. Um, this was done mainly because there were two communities that maybe uh, did not always need the same uh, properties. So on the remote sensing community, we were satisfied with cloud optical depth effective radius and others as well. It's not the only parameters, but some other communities needed this droplet number, for instance, for aerosol cloud interaction. And um, so there were ways to use cloud physics to relate these four parameters. So I won't go into the full detail, but I will explain you the basic idea. And one important thing to understand is that if you are looking to this relation, they fall under two constraining approximations, the two main approximations here. The first one is that you will have to consider that the radius that is retrieved by the satellite corresponds to the cloud top radius of the, of the cloud. That's not a given, and I will discuss this later. Um, but this is one of the assumptions that we are making to get the formula that I will show later. The second, um, the second approximation is that you have to uh, give some idea of the cloud vertical profile. In the retrieval, I said everything is vertically homogeneous. But here, uh, you will need a more realistic cloud profile, and we are using an adiabatic growth. So adiabatic growth, uh, the, the figure below shows a bit what it means. So on the left panel here, you get the supersaturation. Um, the y-axis is the height above the base. So you get zero is the cloud base and 100 is the cloud top, 100 meter. And on the x-axis here, you get the supersaturation. There are two curves, uh, two different lines. So one is dashed. It depends on, on the vertical velocity at cloud base. We can just look at the plane line, doesn't matter. The, the idea is the same. 
So the supersaturation is increasing until you reach a maximum. So it increased due to uh, adiabatic cooling. And then once you reach this maximum that you start using the water vapor to uh, really, once you activate it, uh, your, your particles, you're using up this water vapor. Uh, so there is a sink and also the release of latent heat um, is causing the, the decrease of supersaturation. So the maximum corresponds to the point where you start uh, activating your particle, you start creating, you see the number of droplets increasing until this maximum. Once the maximum is reached, then there is no reason to activate anymore. Um, well, this is of, of course a theoretical model um, and your number concentration will remain constant with height. So that's the direct consequence of this thing. Uh, and then the radius increases um, like this, uh, so a square low, and there you get a constant increase of the mass in gram per square meter. Yeah, so uh, this is what an adiabatic model looks like. It can be subadiabatic um, also if you add some uh, correction factor, but this is basically the idea. The droplet number is constant with height. That's what this model approach tells you. Um, so using these two approximation and use, you can relate the ND, the droplet number to the optical depth tau and the effective radius RE. Uh, so this is a quite complex uh, equation, not complex, but there are lots of parameters that just showed up uh, suddenly. They are listed here, but I will discuss them individually later. So I'm not going to discuss too much. You can, um, you can put typical numbers in there. Uh, so one of the first approximation uh, that was obtained was this relationship that looks a bit more smooth that you can easily use in your studies uh, for quick, um, quick results. And so you see that um, the, the relation is in optical depth one half and effective radius five over two. So the big, um, the big sensitivity is on the effective radius. The, the effective radius is really giving the sensitivity to ND. All right, and so using this relation, and you can find it in the in this. Um, oops, sorry, you can find it in this uh, Quas 2006 paper. Uh, you will get um, this map, and that was sort of it's not the first maps of ND. There were others that I will discuss later, but this was really using this approach that was one of the first time that we saw globally what does the wall look like in terms of droplet number, what's the distribution of droplet number over over the globe. Um, so you can see a lot of things. We can spend a lot of time discussing uh, this, this map. So there is clearly a hemispheric contrast, for instance, you see very clearly that uh, over the north hemisphere, the droplet number is higher. And this is also due to the land. So you see the land sea contrast is quite strong. Um, so it could be uh, considered that the land, you have more aerosols above land, so the ND could be higher. Of course, that might be one option. Also, the stronger updrafts at, uh, at times over land when you have a convection. Uh, you also see near the, the tropics, uh, the, the poles, sorry, you have an increase of the, the cloud droplet number. Um, so this was, yeah, the, of course, there are a lot of issues and I'm, I'm discussing over land. Uh, the retrievals are also more difficult and there might be biases that explain these um, differences. So, yeah, a, a lot of things to discuss, but this was uh, mostly the first time that we saw, and I will show more modern, so I'm not going to, on more recent uh, maps, so I'm not going to talk too much about this one, but clearly um, th there are features that are uh, clear and that we could analyze. Uh, basic filtering method, in case you want to use the equation that I showed earlier, the basic filtering will be that you remove the thin clouds, the optical depths less than four, and the small effective radius. And one of the reasons is that the, F, the radius uh, retrieval from a satellite gets a bit too uncertain and it, it leads to a lot of uncertainties. All right, so uh, this equation, I encourage you, if you are interested in it, not to just use the easy one, but to, to try to understand this one. And you can look at the Grovenor paper here where you have the full demonstration that is very uh, nicely made. Um, of how you get from optical depth effective radius to ND and you get the, the full the, the full detail. Here I will just discuss the different terms and tell you what how uncertain they are. So K is a shape parameter, so it, it's the width of your size distribution. Basically, it's related to the effective variance that I mentioned earlier. 
uh, it's related to link the effective radius to the liquid water pass. Um, there are some assumptions. You have typical var values here that you could reuse. Uh, still, uh, it's, it remains uncertain, and the, the, the Grovenor review, um, it uh, associated an uncertainty of 12.5% to this parameter. I will give some idea of uncertainty just so you get a, an over, uh, overview of where are the issues and where we need to improve things. Uh, the condensation rates also, uh, so it gives you the increase of water mass or water liquid water content with heights in uh, moist adiabatic uh, ascent. Um, so this is, uh, yeah, not not too uncertain. You can relate it to the pressure, the temperature, and you can compute it theoretically uh, quite fairly. Uh, and then you have the adiabatic factor. That's another thing. Are your cloud purely adiabatic, or so are they following exactly the theory that I showed before, or are they a bit subadiabatic or not? Um, so, uh, well, Elias models or using LIDAR uh, measurements, you can estimate the degree of subadiabaticity, and we know it's somewhere between 0, 0.1 and 0, 0.9, and a typical value here will be 0, 0.66 obtained from LIDAR uh, for stratocumulus. Again, we talk a lot about stratocumulus here because these are the most homogeneous and, and kind of uh, textbook clouds uh, a bit easier to treat. Um, and ND profile itself uh, has to remain constant with height. I told you this was one of the assumptions. Um, from aircraft measurements and ES prediction, we know it's, it's not unreasonable. Uh, this is what you observe, except closer to the top, for instance, where you get mixing um, and at cloud base, of course, where you activate. Otherwise, it's, it's a, it's a Good assumption, but there are of course uncertainties when you don't look at stratocumulus or convective cores, then uh, your sensitivity will be different and, and you might not get a constant ND with height. So here we don't associate uncertainty, but we, we warn uh, for caution for non stratocumulus or non convective core amounts. And then you have some uncertainties that are related to the, the retrieval of TO and RE. I'm not going to detail them, so I just listed some keywords. The main one and the only one that I will discuss in more detail is the vertical penetration depth. So that tells you how far your instrument, your remote sensing, sees into the cloud. So your uh, radiometric measurement, it, it goes inside the clouds until some optical depths. And so you might not look at the effective radius at cloud top, but a bit below. And this I will discuss. Of course, you have um, the issue that your retrievals are obtained using vertical homogeneous model and you interpret them using an adiabatic model, which is not vertical homogeneous. So this also leads to biases. Uh, and then you have uh, other effects like 3D effects, horizontal heterogeneity and angled, viewing angle, solar angles, which I will skip on, but you have to keep in mind. Um, so the penetration depth issue is as follows. So if you look at the cloud from base to top in terms of optical depth, so here the cloud base is at optical depth of eight and the cloud top at zero, obviously. Um, if you are looking at typical modest retrieval, they give you three channels. So the retrieval are of the effective radius is using the 1.6, so the point is missing here, but 1.6 micron channel, a 2.2 micron channel or 3.7 micron channel. And the, the larger, the farther you are going into the near infrared and the closer you are to cloud top because you are more sensitive to the cloud emission, thermal emission. Um, so the 3.7 here, if you just look at the arrows, not mind the rest, it's, it points to two. So it means that the 3.7 basically is looking at an optical depth of two inside the cloud. The 1.6 looks at an optical depth of 3.6 about uh, inside the cloud. So the 3.7 is closer it represents effective radius closer to cloud top, but it's not yet at cloud top. It's not exactly there. Uh, so the assumption that we made earlier was uh, not accurate fully because we are not sensitive to the cloud top, but at an optical depth of two which, can, two, which can be a few hundred meters inside the cloud or a few tens of meters inside the cloud. All right, uh, so Overall, so I came back to the same thing, so you don't need to relook at the all equation, just the line here, the, the second line. Um, so doing all this error uh, characterization, the Grovenor et al. study uh, gave an error of about 50%. So there is still a lot of room for improvement. That's what I'm trying to say with that. 
there is a lot of room to improve our uh, understanding of ND, but we still a fair, we get a fair estimate. 50% is a lot, but not necessarily. Uh, but this is for homogeneous stratocumulus, and as you stray from this assumption, then the errors are getting higher. So extra suggestions for you if you are planning to apply this formula. Um, use the 3.7 micron channel for your uh, for the cloud effective radius, at least. Uh, avoid multi-layer condition, I mean with ice clouds or with aerosol above the cloud, and that also adds some uncertainties that I did not discuss, and uh, use the following criteria for the for uh, the, the zenith angles of the sun and of these instruments. There are more filtering methods. If you look through the literature, it will be too long to, to detail all of them, so I list just a few. Um, there is this uh, Bernard Sennerhaus study that looked at, um, they, they proposed to filter out uh, under this condition to that the effective radius at 3.7 micron, which is closer to cloud top, is bigger than the effective radius at 1.6 micron and 2.1 in between. This constrains the vertical adiabatic model. You remember that RE increases with height and that um, the 3.7 micron looks at closer to cloud top. So if the adiabatic model is verified, then this condition should be verified. Uh, other studies proposed to look at adiabatic cores that they are more representative of uh, really what happens uh, if you are interested in aerosol cloud interaction or or in just cloud physics of the, the creation of the cloud core and after it's the anvil is uh, just uh, different things. So this will mean looking at the top 10% of the effective radius. You constrain any cloud scene to the top 10% of cloud optical depth or cloud optical thickness. Um, so this is where we are kind of um, currently, if you are looking at this bimodal approach. So there is a very nice paper by Chris Peart et al. Uh, just published that uh, compared this, all these different filtering methods uh, together with in-situ data. And he showed a good news, which the first thing is that whatever filtering method you are using, the correlation with the, the cloud. So here on the y-axis, you get MODIS and on the x-axis you get in situ ND. There are not many cases, just 60 maximum, but using still the 60, you can see that the correlation is pretty good. So the assumptions that we are making uh, seems to be pretty good, at least if you are looking at this campaign or these campaigns, I think there are several. Um, and then you can apply the different filtering. So this was just filtering about optical depth and effective radius, the early one. This was the filtering of the Grovenor 18 paper that I, I showed just here. This one, these suggestions, these are additionally this suggestion, and this is additionally this suggestion right here. Um, so whatever the filtering method, uh, it shows that some are better than other. The R square is higher in this BR17. But you are also losing a lot of cases. You are down to 17 points uh, compared to 60 originally for this more simple one. So uh, it all depends on which application and what you want to do with the data. You have to decide what's the filtering, but also, yeah, it's that's also a message is also that we need to improve this this retrieval. It should not change that much, and we should not need to over filter that much. So we should find other methods that are uh, maybe better or more more robust to such retrievals um, instead of over filtering. Uh, so uh, here is where. So this is the the figure from the Grispear 2000. Uh, 22 paper. And so just look at the diagonal here, ignore all the non diagonals. So you can just look at the diagonal. And this is the cloud droplet number concentration values here between 0 and 300 using the different filtering methods. So here is on the top left will be Q06. So very little filtering until the max filtering on the bottom right. So you see again that depending on what you are filtering, the, the world in terms of droplet number does not look the same. And that might be an issue if you want to know exactly what the droplet number is, but it also means that the different filtering are targeting different clouds. So the bottom right, which is looking at cloud cores, is just giving you, you know, mostly convective core uh, droplet number, whereas the others might be including more um, stratocumulus or stratiform clouds and the entire cloud, including the anvil. So it depends what you want to do. You can choose your know, filtering method, of course. But again, uh, this can also tell us that we need to, to find alternate methods and not just focus on this one that we're using right now. 
Um, yeah, so uh, I just listed a few extra methods here and I will finish on that for the droplet number. So there are perspective alternative emergent methods that are growing up and that have been used also for a while. You can use polarization information to provide a better estimation of the effective radius and also constrain the width of the size distribution. You can use microwave radiometer also to retrieve RF better because this is the parameter that gives the most sensitivity to ND. You can use LiDAR measurements also to get the cloud top information that you need. And you can use different methods for convective cores. So I listed a lot of studies. You can just look at them if you're interested in these topics because unfortunately uh, I, I, there is no time to list everything. Okay, uh, one quick uh, comment here is that there was there are other methods and then using satellite retrievals. And one early method to get ND was to relate it to SO4 concentration. So you can, they are from institute data, and this is early um, Boucher and Lohmann 1995 paper. Uh, you could relate the CDNC, so ND, to the sulfate's mass concentration, and you could find a relationship that you can parameterize and use this parameterization to find to estimate globally what uh, the droplet number looks like. So this um, was shown to not agree with satellites early on. Um, so this is a, a figure that shows the droplet radius that is using that is calculated using this uh, approach in red and in black is MODIS as function of the cloud optical aerosol optical depths. And you can see that they do not agree with each other. Um, so this the reason might be that there were too few in situ observation in, to build this relationship. But still, it's not uh, an approach that is uh, abandoned or give up on. So there are more recent studies. You can look at the McCoy's papers um, that's improved on this by using reanalysis data to have more uh, more data to build relationships instead of the few in situ uh, relations, and to include other aerosols, dust, and, and others. And by doing that, you could compare um, MODIS. So this is anomalies, but anyway, uh, you compare the MODIS CDNC in black to the MERA CDNC, which is using this approach in blue, and you can find that the black and the blue here are agreeing quite uh, nicely. So this approach can be used efficiently. So this is an alternative approach. If you don't want to use satellite data, that's also an alternative approach. Okay, so I'll go now uh, to the other topic, and which will be much shorter because it's much more uh, recent, as you will see. Um, so if you are interested in getting the ice crystal number concentration, now um, this is more complex because the formation of ice is more follows more complex um, mechanisms and it's also more diverse mechanisms. So it's difficult to assume there is anything about the vertical profile of ice cloud properties. For the liquid, you could assume adiabatic growth and, and you could relate the optical depth effective radius to the ND. But here uh, we spent quite some time thinking about this. Uh, we could not relate and the uh, and i the ice crystal number concentration to uh, optical depth and effective radius so um, that's why it took so long to develop something new uh, and for a long time there was no constraints on the on the ice crystal number from observation so since the model starting to need the drop the ice crystal number then if you look at different models and these are uh, um, old simulations. Now things are improved, but you could see that in um, early simulations, uh, this is from Aerocom in Direct3 experiment, and you can see that the ice crystal number is totally different in absolute values, but also in patterns. So the, the simulation didn't agree with each other because there was no observational constraint beyond in situ data. Um, so as an alternative approach, uh, we worked on uh, developing <coughs> using LiDAR radar information. So instead of, because we cannot assume anything about the vertical structure, we have to look through the cloud and retrieve the vertical structure. And so that was the idea, using LiDAR and radar observation to constrain uh, the cloud information. And what we are constraining is the size distribution here. So uh, the LiDAR is sensitive to the cloud top and the radar is sensitive to the cloud base. Uh, the cloud top is form of small ice particles and the cloud base after growth of the small ice and 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 uh, yeah they 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 fall down and aggregate to give larger crystals so and the radar is more sensitive to these large crystals so overall if you take a size distribution which is given here so this is the distribution of size of crystals well in green 
the, the small eyes will be constrained by the LIDAR and the large eyes will be constrained by the radar with an overlap region. So that's the approach that we are using, basically. So uh, we developed this product called Dardar Nice. So it was built on a Dardar, which is a LIDAR radar product, to develop an ice component, so retrieving the ice crystal number from this. So the basic idea is that you have two pieces of information, LIDAR radar here. This is a case study of a, a frontal, uh, some uh, fronts basically. Uh, so the right, the radar sees the entire cloud. The lidar sees the cloud top, and so you get two parameters: the uh, reflectivity and the extinction. So two parameter means you can retrieve two parameters as well, two quantities. So we are retrieving. I will go a bit faster here, but we are basically constraining the size distribution, which is normalized. It's a normalized approach, but this is a, a technical detail. So we are retrieving the size distribution and then we can integrate fully the size distribution or from a certain size. So we start on integration from five microns to exclude small particles. Uh, well, very small, which could be aerosols and we get this image. So we got here retrievals of ice crystal number and you see an increase here, for instance, and, and the, that's uh, so closer to the to the front or the, the high vertical velocity. You have high ice crystal number and towards the edge of the anvil, it gets uh, less. So that, that seemed to make sense. So from this, uh, we could build a data set of 10 years or more of uh, ice crystal number, this is what it looks like. So if you're looking at maps of ice crystal number, you get the number that decreases with temperature bin. So this is N as function of the temperature and it decreases. Uh, you see a jump from below minus 40 degrees to above minus 40 degrees when the homogeneous nucleation start to kick in and create a lot of ice crystals. Um, so this is, this is something that physically seems to make sense. Below that, if you're looking in non orographic and non convective region, um, the ice crystal number does not increase very much. It remains quite flat, so you don't generate more ice crystals. But if you're looking in orographic region where the updraft is very high, then you get these strong features where you create more ice crystals. And this is the same in um, convective regions where you also get a lot of ice crystal. So this is the top panel. The bottom one shows only the large, the number of large particles. It's the opposite. You have less large particles, except in convective regions where you have the opportunity to send uh, large due to the updrafts, you get uh, large particles that can reach quite cold temperatures. OK, uh, so you can look at zonal means as well, because now we have the vertical profile. Um, so you see uh, here, uh, there is a seasonal dependence where the higher number is during uh, the uh, hemispheric winter because you have stronger jets. Um, so you, you see you see this happening. I will we'll skip that. And of course, we evaluated that against in situ measurements and we saw that it was not too, too bad. Um, so you have a Julia database, which is developed in, in Yulish. Yeah. And um, it, it, it gets, so you get in blue the, the database. Um, no, she's not here. Um, sorry. So here in blue, uh, you have the median of the in situ database that is flat, so there is no dependence with temperature. And in red, you have the satellite data. And first, you can see that it doesn't disagree too much. It's still a good agreement, except that the satellite provides a stronger dependence to temperature and still a certain temperature. Um, so if you look at the same, so this is still the median. In blue, you still have uh, the in situ, and in in uh, colors, you have um, the satellite for different seasons and for different regions. You can see that the difference between in situ and satellite comes from the tropics. So that shows also that uh, there is more effort to do in tropics to get more in situ data there to verify if uh, the satellite retrieval is good or not. Okay, so I'm coming to my and uh, there is another method that exists, and I'm not going to describe it too much because it's a bit more technical, but basically it uses thermal infrared measurements, radiometers, to um, to use some effect that is called the resonance absorption that is sensitive to small ice. So with this method, they can retrieve the cloud top ice crystal number concentration. Um, and this is what you see on the left. If we use from our study, uh, this Dardar Nice uh, product, you will find similar patterns, so it shows that both of them are okay, but this method is strictly uh, restricted to cloud top properties, while the, the LiDAR radar can see all the way through the cloud. 
Okay. Um, yeah. So this is my uh, take home messages and last slide. So um, I hope I convince you or that you already knew that uh, the particle number concentration is quite a key parameter for cloud studies, that it is uh, still not fully understood and provided in operational uh, satellite product. So you need to compute it yourself at least for the cloud droplet number. Uh, so I gave you some ways to do that. You can estimate it. Uh, you have to be careful about the conditions where you are using it. Uh, about, uh, usually stratocumulus or convective course will be uh, suggested and using a proper filtering because the methods are, let's say the methods are adapted, but they're not optimal. So we still need to develop dedicated optimal methods. And that these are things that we are working on to develop real dedicated retrieval instead of trying to infer the droplet number from other existing parameters. For the ice crystal number, it is more challenging, but the methods itself relies on less assumption because we do not have to make assumptions on the vertical profiles among. And so the assumptions are less. So it's a newer product. It's a more challenging product, but it relies on less assumption. So more universal, you can apply it everywhere, sort of, except for mixed fixed clouds. Um, so all, everything that I discussed and all this, you can always find um, database. Uh, this is not guided, it's global. It's a long-term global data set. They are usually publicly available. You can look at this Chris Peel paper for the droplet number, or you can look at the paper cited for the S crystal number. You can use this. They are, they are out there. And um, yeah, so, but one message is also that there is a need for effort for the community. So if you want to develop new satellite product, these are quantities that you can focus on, that there is a lot of room for improvement uh, on both droplets and crystal size. Um, I think we'll benefit also a lot from upcoming satellite missions that will provide new insight and new measurements, more precise, that can uh, be of great help. So there will be a lot of perspective and opportunities to develop these new products in the future. And um, yeah, these are my message and thanks for listening and I will uh, answer any questions if you have. Uh, thank you, Adran, for the nice uh, talk. And uh, Mahin, are you, are you able to look at, the, are there any questions? Yeah, I saw, but there is no question from the audiences. Okay. Uh, uh, if, uh, if there are any questions from the panels, we can, we can take up. Yeah, anybody in the panel want to ask a question? Uh, yeah, I have one small yeah. question. Yes. Yeah, yeah uh, it's a very nice talk and very interesting. And uh, uh, of course, we understand that there are a lot of uncertainties in uh, satellite uh, derived products, especially in terms of uh, cloud properties. So, uh, what is the what is the uncertainty in this uh, uh, CDNC retrievals? Yeah, so the uncertainty is pretty well. Well, no, it's not known, but in at least. So this is what this study. So if you look at this governor study, it's a big, uh, big review paper. But anyway, I summarized it here. So if you are looking at stratocumulus, which is our optimal case because they are homogeneous and they are. Uh, yeah, they are more simple in terms of cloud physics. Well, not simple, I should not say that, but more. Um, the uncertainty on the CDNC is about 50%. Um, so that's that can be high or low depending on your on your exigence. But yeah, it's, it's not too, too bad, I think. Uh, but this comes from, and we have characterized where the uncertainties come from, and we know how to um, improve this. So yeah, the, the Gris Peer et al. paper showed that the uncertainty might be a bit better, um, but still uh, we are quite focused on very specific cloud types and there is a lot of improvement to make for sure um, to improve this representation. Yeah, but thanks. Interesting question. Yeah, and what is the difference, uh, uh, error difference from uh, uh, pixel level retrieval and uh, like if we consider one degree by one degree, what is the error? What? Uh, between the retrieval. Yeah, level. yeah, that's that's good actually. So if you look at the pixel level, of course, it will be uh, more accurate. We 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 well, we suggest that the retrieval, the filtering should be do on the pixel level because once you start averaging, then you are uh, losing your opportunity to fill uh, to fill um, this. 
The only issue is that on a one by one degree, you might mix more cloud types. So you are mixing together uh, different uncertainties, which you might not have at, uh, at the pixel level. So doing your first, your isolate your optimal clouds at the pixel level and then averaging to one by one degree is what we advise. But that's what uh, this study uh, by uh, Chris Peart et al. did. So he, he is providing a database of one by one degree already filtered with the different options that you can use and it's it's a great database. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. <clears throat> yeah. Mm. Is there anybody else wanting to ask Pustin? Hello. Yeah, Sudarshan. Yes, ma'am. Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, this is a nice talk and I have one question. Uh, this uh, Satellite estimated uh, ND or NI, uh, actually those parameters are made for cloud top. Because satellite can see only the cloud top properties, right? So my question is uh, for aerosol cloud interaction, actually, which is more important at cloud based uh, height level. So in that con um, condition, how we can apply this parameter for better understanding of aerosol cloud interaction? Mm. Yeah, that, that's a very good question. And that's one of the big issues that we have, of course. Um, so what if you are going back to the assumption of adiabatic growth, then you are you are assuming that the droplet number is vertically constant so that the cloud top value might be comparable to the cloud base value. And so you can use the cloud top value for the cloud base. Uh, that That's one assumption that most of the studies have, have done in the, in the last decades. Uh, but we know that this is this might not be uh, really the case. And that's why you need to look at really uh, adiabatic growth if you're really need, if you're looking at the cloud you need to look at the cloud core where this might be more the case so that's why the, some studies are saying that we should focus on the cloud core like this one here and there are also alternative methods so i could not discuss them but uh, if you look at this rosenfeld papers here uh, they are providing an alternative method that uh, provides the cloud base um, adiabatic ND. So if you want to look at aerosol cloud interaction, this method might provide you better results. But it was found that this adiabatic ND is quite similar to uh, if you if you just take the top 10 percent see cloud optical depth. So for aerosol cloud interaction questions, uh, either use the top 10 percent. So you are really looking where your adiabatic assumptions is the most correct and where it might indeed be true that the cloud top and D is related to the cloud base and D. Otherwise, you are losing this connection. Uh, or you can yeah, look at this paper here, the Rosenfeld. But yeah, it's a good question and it's something that we keep in mind for aerosol cloud interactions for sure. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks. Anybody else? Yeah, Udran, uh, um, I was wanting to ask you a couple of things. Uh, one is uh, regarding the, you you mentioned about uh, several, uh, yeah, especially this uh, uh, review paper that you mentioned is quite uh, interesting. I think uh, or, or everyone can uh, have a look at that. And, and the, this, uh, you mentioned about the adiabaticity, uh, like a point uh, six, you have uh, made an assumption for the stratocumulus clouds. So we uh, see, see that is from the um, in-situ measurements or um, you have a, um, uh, we have done some simulations or how how was it uh, um, assumed like that? Yeah, um, yeah, that's, that's also a good point. So th this idea of basicity, so because we needed an idea, we needed a structure, we needed yeah. some and the, the the basic one would be to to take the adiabaticity. We we know that uh, this is the most basic formation uh, mechanisms for for clouds or for liquid clouds. But yeah, so this was not done initially by modeling. It was done here. You need to look at this Brangier paper. Yeah, Brangier paper. Yeah, I, um, if, yeah. But uh, I think I don't remember is exactly. Maybe it was point three or. Uh, it, because many many models also adiabaticity is uh, um, 0.3 is used, right? So that's why yeah, I was uh, asking. Yeah, sorry, the sub adiabaticity, yeah, the adiabaticity yeah. factor here. Yeah. And so uh, another another point you mentioned about is, is the condensation rate, and uh, yes. then uh, layering of clouds. Uh, there are a number of uh, points came up, uh, and. Uh, 
um, among the layering of clouds, uh, non-homogeneity in the vertical as well as uh, in the horizontal both matter, right? So the uh, are there any kind of um, uh, investigation done on the uncertainty in that kind of uh, like uh, in the vertical as well as horizontal? Well, the, yeah, the horizontal change in the clouds. Yeah, is, because now uh, we, as you mentioned in the last part of the talk, there there are uh, mm, occasions when uh, radar and lidar observations together can be treated, right? Can be used. So maybe the there is a possibility to use uh, radar observations also. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Yes. but for liquid clouds is more complicated, at least from satellite. Yeah. Because I stick to satellite. Yeah. I talk to about yeah. ground based. For uh, if you have a liquid cloud, the lidar will not get through, uh, so you cannot yeah. get it. You can get information with the radar, but because liquid clouds are close to the ground and you get the, the reflection from the ground, uh, is is inaccurate. Uh, so using lidar and radar technique to get the vertical profile of cloud properties is very difficult. Yeah, from ground base, you can get better results uh, for sure because you are looking up uh, but and closer to the cloud. But we don't have the tools uh, yet. Yeah. From, Especially you may be also considering uh, that non-precipitating clouds, right? Yes, it's true. I didn't talk about this, but for precipitating cloud, we, we assume that the adiabatic uh, assumption is wrong. And, and it's yes, so this will be non-precipitating, but technically uh, it's not clear how precipitation affects our cloud retrievals. Um, mm -hmm. But anyway, uh, the adiabaticity will, model will be wrong. So we are looking most yeah, yeah, of yeah, this uh, Julia database that you mentioned, uh, is, is it uh, available or uh, for uh, yes. some, is it available for modeling community? Yes, I don't know why I didn't put the, uh, <laughs> yeah, okay. the one time I missed to, to put the, the reference, but this is the paper by Martina Kramer. Uh, you okay. have to look at the, uh, the serious guide, uh, it's a mm. 20 paper, um, mm. yeah. So this is available. Uh, you you can ask. It was developed in Yulish, so you Yulia for for Yulish. Okay. Uh, but it, it it's a database that um, gathers um, institute data from around the world. They put them together in a consistent way, and they treat them in a consistent way. So you can use everything together, and it's really really useful, and a great data to, to play around. So yes, uh, Martina okay. Kramer paper, 2020. Okay. Okay. Thank you so much. And uh, maybe there are some more questions uh, by now. Or my hand. Yeah, there are some questions I saw. Yeah. Um, Charlie S B is asking: uh, Could ground-based in situ monitoring measurements of N D and reflect, uh, effective radii be used to validate? Satellite global data retrievals. Yes, of course. We are always looking for in situ data to to further validate or or further develop. Not only validate, but we use in situ data to improve. Uh, really, so the more in situ data there is, and especially from the ground, uh, from many places, uh, we can. We are definitely open to use this uh, if they are available for sure. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. There are no more question. Uh, yeah, just I want to know um, uh, which satellite data it is from uh, that uh, ice concentration are being retrieved. Yes, the, the ice. Yeah. 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 yeah that, that 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 horseshoe um, figure, the global yes. figure you have some. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, so it's our well. It, it was a paper I published in 2018, which is uh, there at the bottom. Um, so the it's the data set is fully available as well. Uh, it was it's it's really the the, the first time we, we got to, to see the the ice crystal number from space other than this other paper that I mentioned as well. And all this is you know freely available. You get the ice crystal number along the lidar radar track. And these are also methods you can apply on the ground if you're interested in getting this. Um, so of course it's. No, I was talking about the other that global distribution of ice concentration that you yeah, said. Yeah, 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 that figure. Same one. It's, it's the same. Yeah, it's the same. The same one. Okay, okay. That's this okay. the other nice. This is the, the same figure. Yeah, these are the results from this method. Here I explain the method, 
and this is uh, the global distribution obtained using that method. Um, so th this is this is that, yeah. Yeah. The lower uh, lower panel, you are showing the bigger particles, or it wasn't very yeah. clear. Yeah. Yes, this because we separate, we can separate the uh, the concentration in small particles. So we integrate the top panel is integrated from five micron in size. So you are integrating all the small particles, but we can also integrate our size distribution from a hundred micron, and we are only looking at the concentration in large particles. So it's interesting because you can get information about different type of nucleation type uh, because the larger particles are mostly heterogeneously formed or from growth mechanisms and the small ones is typically uh, homogeneous nucleation so we can we are able to separate both from our method mm. okay thank you yeah, thanks okay yeah, thank you adran any anybody else uh, any more questions or i think uh, Charlie. Yeah, yeah, Charlie yeah, is asking uh, why is in situ, especially from the ground, helpful for validation? Why? Well, from the ground, but I don't know what you mean exactly from what was meant exactly from the ground. Um, but if you get some idea of the CCN, maybe on the ground, then you can get. Uh, it, 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 yeah. Uh, well, if you if you say that you have in situ measurement of uh, the cloud droplet from the ground, um, I, will, I will trust that your 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 cloud is close to the ground. So this is something we could use if there is a satellite observation on the top to verify uh, really what is happening at cloud base. That was the the comment that uh, was made earlier that we need the cloud base information and that we rarely have this cloud base information to because we are looking at cloud top and we are assuming that what we are seeing at cloud top corresponds to cloud base. So we will need cloud-based information to to validate that uh, assumption. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. There are no more questions. Okay. Yeah. Oh, thanks. Then uh, let us all thank uh, Udran for this uh, uh, very nice talk, and uh, the, I think there is a lot to learn uh, from uh, whatever information he has given, and uh, um, I I also think that this. Uh, uh, the information he has given will be immensely useful for the modeling community. So, um, yeah, this uh, gives a little uh, a different uh, overview about the things. Uh, uh, so, I I would like to thank on behalf of everyone here from IATM, um, Odran. Um, um, uh, yeah, it was very nice. Time. Yeah, thank you so much. Yeah, <laughs> thank you, Odran. Thank you. Thank you and have a good uh, end of the day then. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank yeah. you. And uh, then uh, maybe let us uh, now uh, can request uh, um, Padmakar to stop live streaming. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Bye. Bye all. Goodbye. Thank you. Yeah. Bye. 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 Thank you, Adrian, again. Bye. Yeah. Thanks. <laughs>